Hello, friends around the world. My name is Brandon Neighbor. Welcome to The Neighborhood, where we have switched on fun discussions with some of the most brilliant, successful, experienced, talented, and highly skilled sales and marketing minds on the planet from the world's fastest growing companies. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Today, we have Ryan Burke on the show. Ryan Burke joined Envision back in 2014 as the vice president of sales. Envision has a $1.9 billion valuation and $350 million in capital raised. Ryan quickly grew his remote sales force of three to over 100 talented professionals responsible for identifying new market opportunities for collaborative design, developing new revenue streams, and managing both enterprise and inside sales teams. Ryan was eventually promoted to SVP of sales before taking on his current role as the senior vice president for international at Envision, leading their international expansion efforts around the world. Prior to Envision, Ryan was at Moon Toast as a member of the senior management team. He created and managed both enterprise and inside sales functions, selling both SaaS and custom solutions to clients, including Toyota, P&G, GM, Microsoft, and others. Prior to Moon Toast, Ryan was the SVP of sales at Compete, which was acquired by WPP and later became Millward Brown Digital. He led all sales efforts at Compete as the SVP of sales, including a senior vertical enterprise team, as well as an inside sales team selling Compete.com SaaS solutions. Here we go. Ryan, awesome to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Brandon. I've seen you with a beard, without a beard, and a lot of my research I've been doing in the last few hours here, I like the beard and without the beard. It's very rare you can say that about someone you like it equally, but I typically lean towards the beard, but I really like both. And now it's the gray beard. Now it's the gray beard. <laughs> it's like uh, you go from uh, all all bald on the face to uh, you know some salt and pepper to a lot of salt, and then you just you know it sinks in. This is just a gray beard. This is just a exactly. Gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. You and I um, have gotten to know each other personally over the last few months, professionally as well, yep. which is quite cool. Um, I'm happy that we get to you know go through a lot of this. Um, this content today with you. What I figured we could do is go through uh, some personal stuff first. So start with Ryan Burke as yep. a kid, what you're interested in, yep. uh, then ultimately graduate into pun intended, you know, you where you were, in, were, were in school with uh, Baldwin and the Eagle up in Boston, and then yep. um, all the way through to um, professional jumps into your time at Envision. And in that time, we'll just cover a bunch of uh, superpowers as well as things that I know um, people have said that are, you are um, very good at. And I know that you excel at uh, given a lot of the places you've worked and, and roles that you've had. Sound okay? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Rock, so I'm going to start with... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Let's get started. So, yeah. so Westford MA, what was it like uh, for Ryan Burke as a kid? What were you like? What were you interested in? What were some of your hobbies? Let's go. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So Westford is about 40 minutes northwest of Boston. A uh, typical New England town with, you know, the center of town and the old church and and uh, the common and all of that. And uh, it was great. Kind of prototypical New England childhood, riding bike from the neighborhood and, and doing that whole thing. It was funny. My, my first job actually was um, snake busters. So my buddies and I, when we were, I don't know, maybe 12, decided that we were going to rid the neighborhood of snakes. So we would get walk to people's houses, knock on the door and charge a dollar a snake. And uh, wow. it went, it went well, it went well. We made all these crazy tools and t-shirts, but we ended up just grabbing them with our hands, harmless garter snakes, but it went well until my mother came home one day and found a, uh, a giant trash can in the garage that had about 40 snakes in it. And 40 um, snakes. <laughs> that was the, uh, that was the end of, that was the end of snake busters. But um, it, was, call, uh, it was, it was a fun. It, did you call it snake busters? Oh yeah, we had the T-shirts that we hand drew. I mean, it was right around. I mean, I'm dating myself, but it was right around the Ghostbusters days. So um, <laughs> that was uh, that was my first commercial endeavor, and uh, <laughs> got me started in uh, got me started in sales. But now Westford Westford was great. You know, it was you know I was kind of the athlete, whatever. You know, captain of the basketball and soccer teams at high school, and you know, uh, it was great. Um, National Honor Society. I got kicked out my junior year and came back in my senior year and won the leadership award. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was a uh, it was a fun time. And uh, yeah, I had nothing, nothing but good things to say about Westford. I, I had a great childhood. I stay in touch with a lot of my friends still from Westford, so pretty close to the community. And the uh, the Great Ghost, which was our mascot, which I still think was a great name. And I was the two hundredth graduating class of Westford Academy. Wow. So it was public high school, but two hundredth. So uh, yeah, old old school, old New England town. 
so one more question, then we'll we'll talk about your move into yeah. into BC. What 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 did your parents do uh, when you were growing up, and what were some of the hobbies and interests you had um, outside of sports? Because obviously you were quite athletic. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So my dad was, you know, that day and age was still the time of the long runs at, at companies, and so my dad was at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. So he was at DEC for a shoot thirty years, I think, long, long time, and. Um, uh, he was great. He ran manufacturing for a couple plants there. My 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 mom worked there as well for about ten years. Is that how they met? No, they met outside of Hartford, Connecticut, uh, in college. Okay. Um, but okay. but my dad had a great my dad had a great run in digital. My my favorite thing was during his retirement um, uh, ceremony. They they renamed the big boardroom, the Bill Burke War Room, and then they did a uh, they did a top ten Bill Burke famous quotes and. Uh, uh, the number one quote for Bill Burke that I'm not sure what it says about him for his 30 years there was fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was celebrated and it was a quote on a plaque and all of that. But for 30 years, that was an interesting and that uh, kind of describes my uh, my dad in a nutshell a little bit. <laughs> if you, it's, uh, funny, it's funny because people that know your dad, if you give him 10 guesses, they'd probably guess it. Uh, people not knowing your dad, uh, like myself, if you give me 100 yeah. guesses, that wouldn't have been it. Yeah. I'm I'm yeah. so glad that that just happened. That was great. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then the hobbies, like, it's interesting. We, we, we grew up in Lind in, uh, in Massachusetts, but for whatever reason, my brother and I got really into fishing. And so, um, that's become a lifelong passion. Um, I actually started and ran a, a fishing tournament for about 13 years on Cape Cod kind of post-graduation. Yeah. The, the head hunt, the Harwich head hunt. And, uh, yeah, it just became a passion and I still fish all the time and I've got my kids involved and all of that. But that was one of the things that my brother and I would sort of hike through the woods and find little ponds and build our little boats or whatever and float out there and catch bass and perch and whatever all day. Um, and then we got the bug and started to get, you know, closer to the ocean and, uh, and, and do some of the, the offshore fishing, which has been great. Wow. Very cool. All right. We're going to get into BC, but I have to go rogue on this one. If, you, if, if, I'm, if you're not a fisher, if you're not a heavy fisherman or fisherwoman, if you're not heavy into fishing, what, what's the best part about fishing? Like, wh- why do you love it? Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, now that we get out offshore and, you know, go out on the ocean, it's just, you're just so in such a different environment and a different mindset and really things just kind of melt away. Right. And just from the stresses of the world being, you know, 10, 15, 20, whatever miles offshore in that type of environment, you know, we go tuna fishing, there's whales jumping, whatever's going on. Like, it's just a real escape. Right. You know, the phones half the time don't work. And so, you know, it's just, you know, a lot of times we'll go out for, a, you know, an eight hour fishing trip and my wife will say, well, you didn't catch anything. What the heck did you guys do out there? You know, you have this small confined space with like three other friends or whatever. She's like, well, we need to talk about the whole time out there not catching fish. Um, and so, you know, it is a fairly intimate in experience as well with your buddies and you know, there's beers involved and all of that. But uh, yeah, I just like the whole like mindset change when you kind of get out of the boat and you're heading out, like everything else sort of melts away the further you get offshore. And uh, um, I really enjoy that. Wow. That's great. And I love from a, from, from your son's perspective as they're growing up, that's so cool that you're bringing them into, you know, your headspace and that world um, to, to truly disconnect like that. That's really special. All right. So yeah. you're, you're, you're away from the ghosts. You're moving on to the Eagles, Baldwin, the Eagle, your best friend. Um, yeah. Why Boston College? Right. And, and maybe a couple minutes on what you were like in university. Yeah. So um, it's funny. BC was the only local school that I applied to. Um, I really want to go to Duke. Didn't get in. Um <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I almost went to Wake Forest and for whatever reason I wanted to go, and, you know, explore another part of the country, but I ended up, um, going to BC, obviously great school. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I'll say like, I, I'm really happy with the decision based on what it was able to give back to my family. And so what happened, you know, BC and the, the, the football games and the tailgates. And so my dad, my mom would, got season tickets and they'd come to every game and just develop it great relationship with all of my roommates and friends sometimes you know inappropriately but like the the conversations they would hear were just crazy but um you know and they got to meet all the other parents and so over the four years like my parents were really involved in my college experience and for them to be honest writing the checks like I felt like that was you know an opportunity for me to give them something back and like I'll always cherish that um bringing them into that experience and we still talk about the glory days of the football games and beating Notre Dame or whatever um, so it was, uh, it was a great experience and being in Boston was, was, you know, a lot of fun. 
uh, even though most of the friends that I had at BC from school like BC are actually from outside of Austin. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, BC was great. We were sort of the heyday of sports when I was there too. We had some good runs. They're obviously terrible now. Um, but I, I also, things considered, I liked having a, a team. You know, my wife went to Holy Cross and I kind of give her crap all the time because you know, it was a great school as well. But like having a team and a brand that you can sort of you know follow and I'd still follow way too closely I know every high school recruit that football team is getting right now. Um, I read it every morning, and it's a little creepy, I know, but I'm I'm, I'm pretty involved. That is a, yeah. that's, that's a job because they come from all oh, over yeah. the country to, to BC, obviously. I did it as a job a little bit. So I got so involved after graduation that I actually started writing um, for a BC website that was all focused on recruiting. And so I did that for about three years just on the side for shits and giggles and, you know, go to the game, sit in the press box, you know, interview Matt Ryan after the game on the field and all of that. And I was like, when I was still trying to figure out if I was going to get into the sports uh, as a career, but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun to do that. You know, it's really interesting. We're going to get into your professional jump. So that's a really good segue. But the, what I find when I'm talking to a lot of these, a lot of folks in this podcast and a lot of folks I really admire professionally with an entrepreneurial spirit it comes out in so many different ways. And I actually don't think that the person talking about it really knows that it's coming out. So from yeah. snake busters all the way through to like, you have side hobbies you've turned into like organized things that you do, like yeah. seeing, like getting into BC sports, writing about it, um, making an organized effort and project around that same thing with fishing, 13 years of, of running that tournament, like taking your hobbies and turning them into something organized, structured so that everyone can enjoy. And you're the driving force behind it with your effort because effort is the great equalizer with an entrepreneurship. I think that that entrepreneurial spirit always comes out in people's hobbies. And I don't think that most of the people talking about it often think about it like that, but it comes, it's coming yeah. out in, in your hobbies right now. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And if you want, I can do a quick sidebar into a hobby that turned into something. Did you hear about my book club? Uh, the um oh don't tell me um scor uh scorpion something what is it yes yeah. scorpions. scorpions 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 yeah tell me about it so i uh, just but um something i'm proud of and something i will also say is potentially my biggest regret but the um uh, my wife was in publishing and you know she'd go to these book clubs and you know she she would come home and you know have a couple glasses of wine and say hey would you talk about the book no we just sort of talked and chatted and drank wine and I was like, you know what? This is a bunch of BS. Like, I'm going to go and I'm going to start a book club to spite your book clubs and just show you that I can build a better book club than any of the book clubs you've been a part of. She's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to call it the Scorpions. Uh, I came up with a tagline that was read, period, bleed. And it, it was all sort of tongue in cheek. So in Boston, it was like the all hard guy book club. And so I got about, I got about seven, eight of my friends who were smart bunch of entrepreneurial uh, folks as well. A few guys that have been CEOs and sold companies and, and um, you know, we, we all read. And so what we did was we would go to places like dog racetracks or shooting ranges and we would, but we would actually, actually talk about the book. So we would actually talk about the book. We would do trivia about the book. And then we would typically end it with a physical challenge to see who could pick the next book. And so what happened was one of the guys that was in the book club uh, worked with my wife in publishing and he released a press release. Cause my whole, my whole point was I'm going to create the anti Oprah book club where a woman can walk into a store and know exactly what book she should be buying her husband, boyfriend or whatever, with like a, a scorpion stamp. Like, and so we reread a book and then we released a press release just for, you know, fun games, scorpions, scorpion select. I don't remember what the first book was scorpion select. This book is their official monthly book club. Da da da. And we did it a couple of times. And the next thing you know, it starts getting picked up. And the I get a call one day from the New Yorker. And the New Yorker says, hey, we want to do an interview with you. You guys have this. We do a feature on a book club every every month. And we read about the All Hard Guy book club, The Scorpions. And we're like, all right. And so called and interviewed me, da, da, da. And they put it on their website. Call back the next day. Hey, this has gotten so, so many hits. We want to go front page tomorrow. Um, we need more pictures. I'm like, I don't have any pictures. Like literally get up that morning with my wife, take my shirt off, put world war Z, which we're reading at the time up in front of me with a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> she snaps a picture on her iPhone. And that next thing you know, that's on the front page of the New Yorker.com the next day. And so then it gets picked up and Gawker picks it up. We have these magazines reaching out. And what happened was it snowballed very quickly where authors were, I mean, uh, agents were calling me and saying, Hey, we want you to review our author's book. We want you to give it the scorpion seal. We made like a seal. 
and all this stuff. And we're like, what is going on here? And we had people calling us from all over the country. Can we start a Scorpions thing? A reality TV show reached out to us. My buddy called me at one point, my roommate from college, and he's like, hey, what? Did you start some stupid book club? Uh, I'm like, yeah, the Scorpions. He's like, well, I'm reading the 50th anniversary edition of Playboy, and you guys are in here. Uh, I was like, what? No. And so we picked up Playboy, we're in there. So we almost got a book deal. We almost got a TV deal. And um, the whole thing sort of faded. It was at that stage where we were all just having kids. A couple of guys were going through selling the company. And so we didn't really give it the attention. Um, but, you know, finally I was able to go back to my wife and say, listen, I proved you wrong. I started started a better book club. And uh, now we, you know, there's still, there's talk of bringing it back. And, you know, because I still think there's actually an opportunity in the marketplace for that sort of anti-Oprah book club. And uh, we actually read good, compelling books. And so that was my, my tie into the hobby question. You know, it's funny. One of the reasons I love doing the personal side before we jump into all this other stuff is um, before you reach out to somebody, before you first have conversations, and when you just look at, um, up, look up on the pedestal of this person at this company with this title and your background, your experience, I think it's quite intimidating to, you yeah. know, when you, when you, when you, uh, before you start having conversations and humanize the experience. And, you know, I, I, that's one of the things I love about, um, about this set, this session or section that is, uh, but you know, you, that's a perfect example of you're like, Hey, quick sidebar. I want to tell you about something. And yeah, it's like yeah. the entire Scorpions book club. I love <laughs> it. It's great. So cool. Yeah. All right. So that is, uh, that is not a segue, but I'm going to create one, uh, into, you know, sure. you're leaving Boston college and yep. Scorpions book club, best thing you ever did, but we'll talk about some of the second and third best things you ever did after, after that, yeah. where you're leaving BC and run us through your professional experiences, um, up through the end of yeah. when you're at compete. So we can jump into envision. Uh, so just run us through, you know, uh, the sure. companies you were at and the roles that you're in maybe like five to seven yep. minutes. So we can, we can get some detail in there as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. The first, the first job I had out of college, I still get amazed at, at the, uh, at the, jobs and internships that today is ha like, I'm really impressed. Like back in my day, it was kind of like, all right, we're going to travel Europe. We're going to screw around after graduation, whatever. And so when I was midway through my senior year in college, a buddy called me and he said, Hey, this is 1996. The Olympics are in Atlanta. And he said, Hey, I work for a staffing company, Ronstadt. I've got to hire like 20,000 people. Do you want to come work for the Atlanta Olympics for the summer? And I was like, sure. I got nothing going on. Like, and I became known as the kid on campus that like I'd walk into any party and be like, Hey Burke, I heard you can get me a job at the Olympics. And I'm like, yeah. So like people would yep. bring the resumes to me at the Olympics. So I think I got 40 kids from BC jobs at the Olympics. So we all went down there. We all rented condos in the same little complex. Uh, and this was back in the Buckhead days of Atlanta. Two of the bars were open until you know, five in the morning until before Ray Lewis ruined it. And, um, you know, so worked for the Olympics, great experience. Uh, I ended up staying there for a year, working for the Olympic committee for a year. And it was just a really, it was a really cool experience. And then, randomly um again i'm still trying to figure things out and i had a buddy call and say hey you want to move to san francisco and i said yep and jumped in the car and we moved to san francisco and slept on a floor, floor for six months and you know tried to figure out did some temp things and then i ended up getting into finance so i got into a uh, a small kind of muni bond equity house um which was which was really cool it was a really small um company so i touched so many different parts of the business um you know from the trading to the operational side and uh, it was good, you know, Series 7, 63, the whole deal. And then I used that as a springboard to get into Goldman Sachs. Um, worked in, the, uh, in the, the private client services group in San Francisco. Goldman, this was sort of during the heyday, too. So, you know, yeah. managing some of the early Amazon folks back in the day and making some of those trades. I was like, what am I doing wrong? Um, and uh, so it was great. And, you know, I had a good experience at, at Goldman. And then it just, I got to the point where, you know, there were some family polls back to the East Coast. And at the same time, I was at that stage where I was, you know, on a pretty good trajectory in finance. But there was just something about finance that wasn't really getting my juices flowing. And I just knew, I mean, just the culture of it. And it was very obviously money oriented and people were doing very well. And I just, I don't know, it just, it wasn't for me. And so I knew like, if I didn't get out then, like I was just going to double down, sort of sell my soul and, and, and do the, do the finance thing. And um, so I pulled the plug and I, I, I found a job back East at a, um, at a, uh, a tech consulting company. So this is the tail end of sort of the internet boom. And I got into a company called Mainspring, which was really interesting. It was a really smart group of, of folks from BCG and McKinsey and Bain that basically wanted to create a digital strategy consulting firm. This is just at the time when all these companies are trying to figure out a digital strategy. Nobody knew what it meant. Um, and 
it was also interesting in that it was a it was a sales they had a sales function. So I joined as a as a inside salesperson, which was you know your typical cold calling bullpen environment and weird because you're dialing for dollars for high end strategy consulting and it actually differentiated us in the market a little bit, but I really cut my teeth in inside sales there and just opening doors and, and, you know, prospecting and overcoming objections. I really liked it. And, uh, mainstream actually had a pretty good run for a little while. We ended up going public. Um, and then, you know, the market sort of tanked and then IBM ended up acquiring, uh, mainspring. And so, um, it, it ended up working out and that, you know, it was kind of offered a, you know, package. You know, I could have stayed at IBM. It was another one of those decisions where, similar to financial services, it was like, all right, I could take a job at IBM, but do I want to do that long term at this stage of my career when I knew I wanted to be in something smaller and entrepreneurial? And I liked the you know the small team environment. Even at Mainspring, when I started, there was only like 100 people or whatever it was. And then, uh, and then I got into. That's when I got into compete. You spent 11 years there. There's a lot of learnings here. So if you want to take yeah. your time and, and uh, go through the next few minutes, talk about some of the things you learned as you're jumping through each individual step that you had. Um, that's all right. Yeah. Because that's, that's probably helpful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And so Compete was interesting because that was back in the incubator model days. So basically, Compete was an incubated business. David Cancel, um, you know, who's the CEO of Drift, um, was kind of the first employee founder there. And so I joined early on. It was basically we had a we had a web based panel that we aggregated data and sold back sort of competitive intelligence to companies. So hey, my my website traffic is this. How does this compare to my peers? My conversion rate is X on my site. How does that compare? Um, and you know, there were some dark days early on. You know, there was your typical startup, you know, really young management team. You know, screaming matches in the glass. You know, encased you know, conference room that was like raised four feet above so that everybody could see it, you know, and it was um, a few turnovers of, of kind of senior leadership early on, a few turnovers of the entire sales team that I survived twice early days. Um, and uh, we did that for the first probably two to three years. I was kind of the, you know, the top salesperson and, um, you know, worked with some really smart people. And again, that entrepreneurial environment that I, that I liked, we, we had trouble figuring it out. And then for us, at that point, the inflection point was really when we decided to go vertical. And, you know, obviously not something that I think every business needs to necessarily do, but from a competitive standpoint, um, you know, I helped found uh, kind of the wireless practice. And this was back in the Nextel singular AT&T, you know, days. And um, they were all so hyper competitive. And so, we had this really rich data set to show like how much online traffic are each one of these sites getting? What is their conversion rate to get people to sign up for bill pay? What was their conversion rate for e-commerce and cool. really valuable data. And so we built some dashboards, we layered on a consulting component on top of it. And, um, and uh, it was really, it was really interesting. And that sort of was a pretty big catalyst. Wireless became the biggest vertical at the company. I sold the biggest deal to Sprint, which is 500,000 when our ASP was like 30 grand. And it was, it, it was, it was interesting in the fact that as a salesperson, what kept me there as well is when I started that vertical, um, you know, I was able to position myself as more than just a salesperson and I became a wireless expert and I would go speak at conferences. I would write white papers because that always gave me the credibility when I wanted to go and sit in a room with senior folks. Um, I mean, we would do crazy stuff. Like I had business cards made that, you know, different business cards for like the big wireless conferences, the CTIAs or even the CESs. And I'd get invited as press because I would write white papers or, you know, and so they would, they would put me as press of like, I get to sit down for 10 minutes with the CMO of Verizon and the CTO of AT&T to do briefings. And inevitably you share some data. And the other thing that we did at the time was we partnered with uh, Bear Stearns, who uh, you know, was a big analyst in the wireless space. And we created this really nice white paper that you know they distributed, you know, glossy cover, Bear Stearns, and it was all our data. And like, you know, we free data for Bear Stearns, whatever. But that became a little bit of like every meeting we would walk into, that was on somebody's desk. It's very easy to point to that and say, oh, that's our data in there. And they're like, oh, really? Like, we didn't know that. Tell us what you did. And so 
you know, building a brand beyond just being a salesperson was really valuable to me from a career perspective. And, you know, partnering with somebody like Bear Stearns at the time was really powerful in the space from a, you know, wireless analyst perspective. And using that as a vehicle for content was just so big in building our brand at the time. And so, um, so that was the kind of the earlier part of my career at, at Compete. You know, there's always times that I thought about leaving, and um, but every time it was sort of thinking about it, like there were new opportunity would arise. And so then I moved into more kind of sales leadership, and that was a new challenge and building out sort of an inside and, 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 and an enterprise sales team. Um, then, then we were acquired. So the company was acquired by TNS, big research current firm. And then six months later acquired by WPP. So essentially acquired by WPP became part of that world. And that opened up a whole new, you know, world of opportunity and challenges. And, you know, that kind of put me into a new role. And then I became head of global sales, SVP of all sales, um, across compete. And that was within sort of the WPP, you know, umbrella organization. So that was fun. So yeah, I was there a long time, but, you know, worked with some really sharp people. Um, you know, my old boss, Scott Ernst, sort of, I kind of followed him up as well when he became CEO and one of my mentors to this day. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a really interesting ride. It was definitely a really interesting ride. Very cool. And that bring, does that bring us to your jump into Envision at this point? I did have a, I did have a, uh, a quick move uh, between there. I went to a company called Moon Toast. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and, Moon Toast. So, hey, before you do yeah. that, um, I want to talk about, um, you mentioned managing enterprise and inside sales teams. Um, yep. you, you've done this at three different organizations, if not yep. more, if you've done some advisory work on this. But you've done inside yep. and enterprise sales at the same time. A lot of the people yep. listening will either start a business, have started businesses, will be the VP of sales, VP of marketing, whatever. And they'll either inherit inside, sa- inherit inside sales or inherit enterprise sales. And usually they kind of tack one on to the other or they graduate from inside sales leader into enterprise sales. You've managed both at three different businesses. Yep. Let's talk about yep. that for a few minutes here. What are the sure. main, what are the main um, best practices or tips that you have in managing inside yep. sales? As a as a as a contrast to managing enterprise sales, and we'll get into the top tips and best practices for that. But inside sales first, inside sales. What are the biggest differences between managing enterprise and inside sales teams? You're talking about inside sales, and what are the best practices and tips for doing that? Yeah, uh, no, that's a good question. And, and you know, I think the the end of the day, it's still you know, inside sales is obviously a lot more transactional, and so it's a lot more around kind of that process and. You know, enterprises around process as well, but obviously a very different motion, trajectory, timing, all of that. And so, you know, with inside sales, I would say one thing that's probably, you know, most important is like figuring out what that customer journey is upfront and really defining that path, defining those friction points, and then building, building a process around what are the activities and behaviors that like, to me, like everything kind of boils down to behaviors and activities when it comes to sales. And that's relatable to inside and enterprise. And so performance and numbers is one thing, but you just need to figure out what the right activities are for inside sales. So break apart that funnel, figure out what those metrics are, and then really measure on those activity metrics. Um, and that's been probably the most important thing. And the, the other thing is even when I started Envision, we'll talk about, but making sure you have the operational sort of infrastructure to define that for inside sales, whether it's you know hiring an operations person. Like to me, you can never hire operations too early. I probably waited. I probably waited too long at Envision and getting that in there early for for inside sales um, and building out the you know we even call them leading indicators of um, you know what will drive you to a particular transaction. And so I think those behaviors and activities are incredibly important for for inside sales. And then you just have to evolve it for enterprise because it's a different motion, different ASP, whatever it is. And so same concept around leading indicators, behaviors, and activities. It's just a different, it's a different framework. And the, the hardest part is obviously, you know, you sort of view inside sales as the stepping stone to enterprise. And that's not really the case from a mindset standpoint. And that's, you almost have to break bad habits and rebuild them because the inside sales folks, and you know, even currently really good transactional driving local acquisition, boom, boom, boom. And then you move into enterprise, you're like, whoa, slow down. You know, let's talk now we're value selling, where before it's much more of a product sell. Inside sales is much more of a product sell. Enterprise sales is a value sell. And that's a big transition from a mindset standpoint where step back, you know, make sure you're asking these questions, figuring out obviously things like pain or whatever it is, 
And again, when we promote inside salespeople, sometimes there's that period where the onboarding for enterprise is just as important as when you onboarding them as a new employee for inside sales, because it's a total new uh, framework and mindset. And if you're using the methodology like medic or Sam or whatever it is, you've got to kind of break them down and rebuild them again. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So moving from compete to moon toast yeah. and then, and then, so let's, let's, let's hop into why you moved to moon toast and then give us a, a summary sure. of that. And then we'll hop into envision. And I've got a few questions on some of the superpowers that you have, some of the things you've done yeah, really well and, 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 and a couple that envision has as well. Yeah. And so moon toast was a social advertising, uh, kind of rich media, social advertising, rich media within the Facebook feed predominantly or any, any social feed. And, um, you know, part of it was that was at the time I was looking to get out of compete and, you know, moon toast came along. Social was obviously very sexy. They just raised some money and, you know, I kind of wanted an opportunity to go in and be the guy from day one and build it up. And, um, you know, it was, you know, everybody's got a miss on their resume and, you know, the, this was, this was a mess. Right. And, you know, I came in and, you know, we had some good momentum, you know, really enjoyed kind of the, the product team and sort of position we had in the market, but we also existed within the Facebook ecosystem, which I don't care what you say. They, they just own everything. It's really hard to exist. They make one change in their technology and like 20 companies go out of business. So I built a really strong team. I hired my top guy from uh, Compete, brought him over, hired some really good salespeople, a few who have actually taken to Envision. Um, but the 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 product we had to repivot the product and so we ultimately had to replatform we tried to fill the gap with services while we got the platform the facebook changes like we missed it we just missed the window and things got a little ugly it was one of those startup things where you know the you know it was a little messy and uh and so i ended up leaving i ended up just saying you know what we're i'm out and you know and most of us ended up you know um you know not seeing, uh, you know, uh, seeing their future, but, uh, you know, leave it at that. But I left. It was a good learning experience. Met some really good people there. Um, social space was interesting. I'll never go back. Um, but it was, uh, um, you know, and then I you know, left there and then that was when I had the opportunity at Envision. And okay. I can tell you kind of how that's, how that started as well. Yeah. I, so this is good. So people are going to want to hear the story. You joined really early. You're yep. employee number 35, I believe yep. at Envision. You've yep. got upwards of almost, if not above, around the thousand employees or so. Um, yeah. Shed load of them remote, if not all of them remote. Uh, all of them. And they can't, exactly. All of them remote, like the largest that I know of tech workforce in the entire world that is remote. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So um, yeah. tell, tell us about the story and run us through the journey that you've been on so far. And then I've got a question around um, building your sales teams from one to 50 that we'll cover um, after you kind of yep. tell us what the journey is up until now. Sure, sure. And so the, the the quick story and how I ended up at Envision was, you know, I I, I quit Moon Toast. So I was out of a job. And was in sort of this panic mode. And, you know, got some opportunities right away. And I was like, I don't want to, act, you know, move too quick. And then, you know, just really stressful. My time alive. Couple kids like the whole deal. Like, what am I doing? Um, and it was really close. I had paper in hand to to sign uh, an offer as a CRO of another company in Boston. Ended up being out on a boat with a few folks for my old boss, Scott, Scott Ernst, goodbye from Compete. And um, we're sitting with Dave Cancel. We're having a beer on this boat and telling him about my situation. I've heard so many good things about Dave, by the way. So many good things through the grapevine. Oh, yeah. Um, he's great. I'm, I'll, I'll meet and, him sooner uh, and later, but uh, it, I've heard he's such a good guy. Yeah, he is. And uh, so sitting on the he was like, hey, don't sign that paper. I was like, what? He's like, you need to talk to Clark at Envision. And I was like, I don't know anything about Vision. And he's like, design prototyping software. I was like, I don't know anything about it. He's like, talk to him. I'm like, all right. Uh, so I didn't sign the paper. I had a couple of conversations. He introduced me to Clark the next day. I had a couple of conversations with Clark. Uh, Clark Wahlberg, the founder CEO of Envision, who's just incredibly interesting, inspiring um, uh, person. And so the the way it worked, the way it went down was there was, know, it was like a Wednesday night at probably 9 p.m. in Boston. And Clark, who was in New York, calls me and he's like, all right, I want you to come down tomorrow and meet with the board and meet with me. I'm like, all right, what time? He's like, yeah, eight o'clock tomorrow morning in, in New York. And it's like nine o'clock at night in Boston. I'm like, all right, I'll make it work. And so I go down there, you know, meet with the board member. Clark comes in and you never met him in person or anything. And he just sits down and he's like, all right, I'm going to spend the next two hours convincing you that this is the wrong job for you. And I'm like, interesting <laughs> and so we ended up having about a four-hour session on 
design space and how enterprise might not work for design, uh, it's a, you know, all of these things. And uh, I remember at one point he was like, oh, wait, when's your flight? I was like, oh, I missed it. It was like an hour ago. And he's like, what? <laughs> Great story. He's like, why didn't you tell me? He's like, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, well, I want the job. Like, this is super interesting. And so, um, and so it was great. So we hit it off. Um, quick, quick fact, Envision before me had a, two VPs of sales. One lasted a week, one lasted a month. And so I was pretty intimidated. And, yeah. you know, they were clearly a rocket ship. Even from the early days, you could just see the momentum. Um, and that transactional business, like we, like I had done some of the inside sales stuff, but like not to that scale before um, and built it from a freemium model. So it was a pretty big leap for both sides and sure. forever great, grateful for, for Clark taking the chance. And obviously it's, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been a successful you know, path so far and a lot of fun, but that's kind of how the whole thing kind of started, which was interesting. Great, great story. And so tell us, um, tell us about how many people were there when you were there, like what the yep. sales team consisted of, which I'm pretty sure was like two people plus you. And, yeah. then, um, and then give us maybe a couple stats on where you are right now as a company so we can understand that growth trajectory and then I'll hop into yep. how, you, how you did a lot of those things. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So when I joined, there was 35 people. I think there were three people on the sales team, um, that, uh, that I inherited and, you know, the enterprise business really didn't exist at that point. It was kind of formally launched a few months beforehand, but really there wasn't, there wasn't much revenue there. Um, but what we were doing is we were getting, you know, about a thousand people signing up for the product every day through the free service or the self serve plan, right? So just incredible product market alignment and, you know, that momentum and those signals for the business. And so I came on, now we are, I think we're about 900 employees now globally. Uh, we work with 100% of the Fortune 100. We are fully remote, uh, raised $350 million um, total. So it's been, it's been, it's been a ride, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun, man. Unbelievable. You've got like almost a $2 billion valuation on that 350 raised. Yep. Um, you've been there for about five years now. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Wow. <clears throat> Amazing. First of all, yeah. congratulations on all the success you guys have had. Um, I just think it's Thank an you. iconic company an I- an iconic story. Um, and I think you guys are a, you know, can't miss, can't lose badass product company who is, you know, building so fast, doing it the right way, yep. which is, which is great. And from the outside looking in, you know, and, and that's even before you and I started having conversations. I'm, I'm so impressed. And um, yep. so let's talk about a couple things. One, you have, you talk a little bit um, in the past around building your sales team from one to 50 and yep. you talk about it using the story of Envision. So let's use that story. Um, but you talk about um, building your sales team from one to 50. You got to think about the three S, the first five, the foundation yep. in the future. Um, let's walk through each one of those bullets, if you don't mind. Um, why don't we talk sure. about the, the first five first? And actually, you know what? If you want to tee this up at all, that's fine. But I, I want to hear about the three Fs for building your sales team from one to 50 because it's an excellent framework. Yeah. And so, you know, the the way I was thinking about it when I kind of look back and break it apart is really, you know, figuring out the right people for each stage because right? it evolves and it changes. And then the, the customer journey changes as you mature and the, the deals get bigger and you move more into the enterprise. And so you kind of have to chunk it up and, you know, hire the right people at each stage, address the customer life cycle at each stage, remove friction points. And so, you know, the biggest thing for, for me early on was um, you know, getting the right people in the boat uh, early. And fortunately for me, my first two hires, two salespeople that one is now a manager for me in, in Amsterdam, the other one's the top rep in, in the U.S., um, still here, uh, which is good because right before I took the job, uh, Mark Roberts from HubSpot, a buddy of mine, um, called me and he was like, I need your two best, if you're on speed dial, who are your two best salespeople? And I gave him these two names because I didn't have a job. And they both got offers from HubSpot and they both turned them down. And, <laughs> it, 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 and thankfully, Roberts was like, what the hell? I'm like, I don't know, man. And uh, so then I got a job. I got the job with the vision a month later, and it just worked out. I called both of them. I was like, "You guys are on the team." And, oh, you know, awesome! Once, and, and it ended up working out really well. And I think the, uh, you know, back to the first five. I think some of the important traits for those folks early on is they weren't necessarily just salespeople, right? Like they they were product managers almost at that stage, and and they just they knew the product inside and out. And you know, without having you know proper you know you know, sales engineer support or any of that product support on calls. Like it was a little bit of the wild west and we had to do our own thing and envision 
couldn't be further at that point, especially couldn't have been further from a sales culture. Like right. it was a free product, free value to everybody, designers, you know, it wasn't a push market. It was full and pull motion. It was all bottoms up. And so we were definitely a little bit out there trying to figure it out. And so, you know, hired these folks early on um, that really could, you know, talk to the customer, understand their, understand their, their, their concerns and, and their process and their journey. And then ultimately we built the sales process around that. Right. And the other key thing about those, those first people are you've got to get the people that are on the boat that want to join a company at that stage for the right reasons. If you want to make a lot of money as a salesperson, start up like Envision at that stage and start, that's not the right place. Right? It's just not go work with Salesforce. Right. And so, um, you need to find people that are there because of the opportunity, right? They, they want the career opportunity. They want to be co-owners and building something. And that's what, you know, the early folks at the, and on the sales team, I actually think to this day, we still hire people with those, with those profiles, the people that were still in the overall, hopefully trajectory of envision, like it's still early. And, um, um, that was really critical to find people that wanted to join for the right reasons and not just purely on the financial side. And so getting those builders in early, the ones that can have those kind of product conversations, that was really important for us early on. Very cool. Yeah, I think in one of the um, in one of the talks you do, uh, you talk about uh, focusing on key traits, resilience, adaptability, yeah. and fighters, uh, and yeah. then focusing on key motivations, opportunity, vision, and ownership. Those six things I think are so important. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I would say resilience is probably the biggest one because at any startup you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have so many challenges. And so, I mean, I've even made some, you know, I've even made some, you know, decisions where we've hired people that have had really good runs at really big companies, and their resumes are, you know, great. And you hire them to a place like Envision, and it doesn't work out, and they're not ready for it. We probably hired at the wrong time. The people that are better off, like I even tell our recruiters, are like. Go find people that had a big run at a company, at a really successful company, then went to a startup that ran out of money or a startup that went out of business. Totally. Fell off and a cliff. Gotten, and, yeah. And they've gotten their nose bloodied. And they know what it feels like because your nose is going to get bloodied at a startup inevitably at some point. And so you need the people that can take the punches and be resilient and battle through that. And not only can do it, but want to do it. Right. And some of the folks we hired, like, they just want to do it at that stage of the career. I don't blame them either. Right. You know, and so... Um, you just got to figure out that profile and make sure that things like resilience that uh, uh, is so important for those uh, for those early hires. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's incumbent upon the person hiring them to help yeah. those salespeople to make that decision. Like oftentimes you don't know that you need to go get your nose bloodied or you need to go have a failure somewhere else. After your first jump from an organization, you've had a really good run or a long run, like you have to go yeah. get that you know, that, that failure, you have to go learn and have that learning experience. Like it is incumbent upon the person hiring those individuals to help those individuals realize whether or not it's the right time in their career to make the jump into yeah. that startup or not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, that was really important early on. And then the only other thing was, you know, I talked about is finding all of those friction points early. So, you know, mapping out that customer journey and figuring out why aren't people buying your product? Is it the price? Do they not trust you, not know who you are? Do they not want to sign up for a long-term commitment? Is it particular features? Like whatever it is, you've got to map that out and then start to figure out how do you remove each one of those and address each one of those. And that's really important early on. And that'll evolve. Once you move into the enterprise, you're going to have different friction points and you have to readdress them. Security and things like that will start to come in a little bit more, you know, uh, overtly, but early on, like just why don't people have the product in their hands and do everything you can to remove those friction points to get the product in their hands? Yeah, awesome. So th there's a couple of examples that you use in some of your past content. Like if price is a friction sure. point, using free trials and freemium, you know, getting the product into their hands uh, with free trials, seeing the product yep. in action, doing group demos you talk about, understanding how they use it, pre populating the assets and pre populating the, uh, the product, lack of trust yep. in your brand, building customer testimonials long-term commitments to a product and you know, offer an opt out, just get them on board. Yep. And then lack of features, you know, sharing the roadmap for the product team from the product team, getting them involved with that journey and setting them up, setting the customers up with the product team to help, you know, evolve that journey. And I thought the examples you used and the solutions to them, I think those are extremely valuable as you're thinking about each one of those different friction points, both as you get started. And sometimes you don't solve those problem points with those solutions that you just talked about until mid stage, late stage and building sales team. Yep. So, 
sorry to, um, to, to, to kind of like, you know, steal some of that thunder, but I thought you've talked about this a bunch of times in the past and using those examples. Yeah. I think that that's really valuable for people and, and, um, that's just great content. So you did your homework, you did your homework, Brandon. Hell yeah, brother. I'm always doing my homework. It's all about the prep in my world. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's first five. Um, now let's talk about foundation. Yep. Yeah. And so the foundation is sort of when you, you know, really want to start building out the process. And that's when, you know, like I said before, like that's when it's really important to uh, hire operations, right? And, you know, because you're going to start to build out the, those leading indicators that I talked about, about what, the, what, are those, what are those activities that you want to measure? Because again, at this stage, it's less about the results, right? I know the results are important, but you really need to figure out like all of the specific activities and that'll lead to a potential success. You can start to understand like what are the what are the points even in the sales process that you need to that you're struggling with, and how do you you know and and, and these aren't these aren't things that are meant to beat the team up on, right? There's always like this head trash. With people like, oh, I don't want you to measure how many meetings I have a week. I don't want you to measure how many prospecting calls I'm doing, whatever. And it's like it's not the point. The point is not to like manage you out if you're doing it. The point is to help identify coaching opportunities for the managers to say, okay, you're not able to get people to respond to your emails. Like, let's go through those and evaluate. You're not getting enough meetings like let's look at some of your other outreach like you're not converting meetings to opportunities let's go through your talk track in those meetings like they're 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 guidelines and they're guidelines and they're really they're coaching opportunities yeah, is what di- they essentially are diagnostics exactly yeah exactly exactly and so you know building that foundation the other thing you know for a specifically for a company like envision is really on is you know, how do you offer value beyond the product? And, you know, I'm really sort of incredibly lucky and proud about what we do at Envision because we offer so much more beyond the product. But that's really important early because to some extent you need to build a trust and the credibility with your customers when your product doesn't always fulfill every promise. And that buys you time. And especially early on, that's really important. So even when the sales team, you know, I never want somebody to prospect and try to set up a meeting with talk about a vision product. It's like offer something with value, piece of content, whatever it is, but like offer value to somebody all the time. And you can, there's opportunities to do that beyond the product. I mean, just a quick, a quick thing. I mean, our CEO is, is brilliant marketer. And one of the things that we did is we made a movie. Um, you know, even when I first started, uh, Clark was like, Hey, we're making a movie. I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, we're making a feature length film on design. It's like, you're crazy. And we hired this production company out of New York and flew around the country. And we made a feature length movie called design disruptors. And it was a intimate look at companies that were using product design to disrupt entire industries. So Google, Airbnb, Netflix, uh, all of these, all of these companies. And we made this awesome movie. We, we weren't in it. Vision wasn't in it, but it was brought to you by Envision. And so what we did was, we did a world premiere in San Francisco, um, Castro Theater, red carpet, press, like oh the whole gosh. deal. Oh my gosh. And we had this is so cool. V- VIP dinner after. Then we did one in New York and we did one in London. And they were huge. And then what happened was the we were like, all right, we're gonna release the movie. But then people started emailing us and saying, Hey, how can we do a screening here? I want my executive team at Uber or at NBC or at Salesforce to see this. And so we sort of weaponized it and we didn't release it to the public. And we said, all right, if you want to do a screening or at your community, you know, wherever, like we will host it. And I think we've probably done 500 screenings across the globe at this point. You name a company, we're doing, we're doing one next week in Europe with a company. And what an opportunity to one, reach out to somebody and say, hey, we've got this incredible story that will help your management team understand the value of a design centric approach. It's super entertaining. Why don't we come on, have some drinks, get a couple hundred people in the room, whatever it is. Sometimes we'll even do a panel. We'll get people and product leads. We'll do a panel discussion after the movie. And it's been such a great uh, vehicle for us. I mean, now we have a full, we have a whole film team now at Vision. We did a documentary with IBM uh, called The Loop on their process, you know, celebrated and, and, you know, evangelized their process, which, you know, sort of strengthened our relationship with IBM, but again, offered value to the community which the movie had ultimately did. Like it was a free offering for us to the community. Here's some really good content, best practices, examples in an entertaining format that we are going to deliver to you as part of what our brand represents. Now we're, we got a new movie that we're releasing this fall. Um, and uh, it's been incredibly successful. It's just another example of like, how do you go ahead? Not everybody can make a movie. I get it, but 
Although I've seen some good copycats over the last six months, or last year, uh, it's coming. It's getting out there. But Clark Valberg, this is yours. It was a, it was a, it was a really powerful vehicle for us. Nice, very good. And so you talked about adding value beyond your product. Um, you talked about focusing on behaviors and activities. You talked about some of the, the activities, and you talk about um, also your um, you're hiring your first layer of management. You talk about hiring coaches, yep. coaches, and not managers. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I just feel like early, early days, you just, you, you need folks that one are, you know, they're not about coming in as manager for, for kind of title reasons. And you get people in there that are really good at coaching because that's what's so critical using those leading indicators, using those behaviors and activities, finding those opportunities to help coach the team. Um, and that's why you can like your first sales director or whatever it might be. Like they've got to be a really good coach because it's going to be all about, you know, the, the failures and the misses early on and the objections, there's going to be so many objections you're going to face, whether it's product price competitors, whatever it is, like you really need to figure out how do you coach the team on overcoming those. And so that's why it's really important from a profile perspective that you really dig in when you're interviewing in terms of, you know, talk me through, uh, talk me through an example of where you identified something with a rep and coach them through it to an improvement. What was the result? Like those types of things um, are really important when you're sort of building that, that, that foundational team. Nice. Awesome. Okay. So that's the, that's the, that's the first five that we just talked about foundation. Now let's talk about future. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the only other thing that I'll mention on the, on the, on the, on the foundation now that you're, you're kind of bringing up the, the topic, which is one of the things that we did at interesting at Envision was you know, it's so important to understand your customer and like everything about their customer. And this, this evolves at every stage. And so uh, early on, like I, I hired one. And so I hired a designer onto our team. Instead of a sales engineer, I hired a designer. And so this person, this person came on board, still with the company is great, um, but just gave that credibility to the sales team in terms of the day in the life of what a designer deals with and could hop on calls and give us some credibility in terms of you know, talking to designers, which is a very unique persona to sell to, right? They don't like to be sold to, right? They, they want to touch and feel product, learn about it, and then use it. And if they like it, they'll tell their friends about it. But so figuring out who your customer is and then hiring them uh, was really important as well. The other thing that we do now, which is an interesting um, kind of nuance, is around understanding the customer. We now have a program called uh, Delicious Empathy. Every person at Envision, anywhere, again, fully distributed uh, companies with people all over the world, and anybody at the company from operations to sales to finance, has the ability to take a designer out to dinner once a month and expense it. The only rule is you the only rule is you're not allowed to talk about a vision. So it's just about again building those relationships, understanding kind of the motivations, the personal motivations even of your customers. And you know, that just feeds into everything that we believe in and do as a company. And so that's been another kind of you know interesting thing for us to do. Um, across the company to help people, you know, build empathy with, with our customers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. You call it, uh, I think you call it relentless focus on the customer and is yep. your, I, it's a pretty, pretty cool example. Delicious empathy. <laughs> I love the the pun. Delicious doesn't take people out to dinner. That's good. I, uh, I'm, I'm not yeah. usually a laggard on, on the, on the jokes, but uh, that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 let's talk about future. Um, so you talk about a foundation, yeah. a f- about a foundation for building the future. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So the future is, is, um, you know, I, I feel like at this point, this is where, you know, you built it, built a foundational team. You've got some infrastructure in place. You're moving into the enterprise. Like this is when things will break. Like things are going to start to break and you've got to kind of revisit the overall customer journey. You've got to revisit the, you know, the, the friction points, you know, as you move into the enterprise, things like legal process, you know, security, all of those are going to be new friction points that you're going to have to learn how to address. And this is also, you know, in, in a lot of cases, this is also when you make that shift from a transactional product focus sale to the value-based one. And that's when you've got to hire a different profile of a salesperson at this stage. You've got to evolve your motion at this stage. And so, um, you know, now is kind of when you're, when you're really selling and, you know, you've got to get people that are, you know, again, stewards of your brand, like along all of this, like your brand is so important these days that just, I think people sometimes underestimate the impact of hiring the wrong salesperson on their brand. And like, you got to think about like, is this somebody that you would want 
in a room with 15 of your prospects or customers, which is someone you would want presenting at a community event on behalf of your brand. And if the answer is no, they're probably not the right person, even if they're the best seller in the world, because they are a representative of your brand. And you've got to create that value through your, your salespeople and that, that it represents the value that you want to project, project in your brand. So that's really important. And the other part about you know, at this stage is you've got to find people that are really good storytellers, right? And that's so important. Um, can they tell a story? Because at this point, people don't really care about your product. Like this is when the transition switches on the customer side as well. They don't care about your product. They care about what the promise of your product can deliver. They care about the results. They care about the examples of what other customers have done to drive tangible business value from the product. And so there's that shift. And this is where you, know, you don't need the, the product experts in the sales team. This is where you can introduce things like sales engineers or more, you know, you know, product specialists or whatever it is to fill some of those technical gaps. But this is where you need people that can actually tell that story and sell the dream of what your products and more importantly, what your brand represents. And that's really important at this stage as you kind of build out the team. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to hop onto a different topic. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we conclude on that? Uh, no, I think that's, I think that's good. Okay, cool. So let's hop on to, um, I've got two more topics I want to talk about and then we'll wrap. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. First one is um, hiring, onboarding, and managing a remote sales teams and, and really remote workforce is what you guys have to manage as an entire business, but specifically hiring, onboarding, and managing remote sales teams. So there's a few different things that, that I'd like to cover. I think there's five total. First one is hiring profile and hiring execution. You know, how do you search for the right person that is the, you know, one, you know, a, a great person to hire as a remote employee, what are some of the things you look for in um, making sure that they can do that? And then what's your execution process look like considering you're hiring people all over the world, you're not necessarily sourcing them in one city or one industry, you're looking for them all over the place. So what's the hiring profile? And how do you execute on the hiring process? A little bit different. Sure, sure. Yeah. And you know, I think we're, I think we are the single largest fully remote company in the world now. It's, it's a, it's a little crazy. And there's definitely cracks at times and, and things. And just a little, a little bit of context. It started where you know, our CEO wanted to hire sort of the best engineering talent. So we started to hire folks in, in different places. And um, even when I started, he was like, hey, if you want us to open up a Boston sales office, you can't. Um, and you know, I did the whole tour of real estate in Boston and almost pulled the trigger. But then it just became part of our culture. And so I started to hire some people from all over. And you could kind of place people strategically in, the, in these in these. Uh, in these maybe lower tier markets or whatever. And so it became really, really uh, valuable for us. And it's a, it's a, it's a big asset. Um, on the hiring, you've got to find people. Not everybody is ready for it, right? The last person you want is the person that's like, I found you on a remote job site and you ask them what they like about Envision. And they say, oh, I want to work from home. Like they're out. And the, the, you do need to find people that are proactive. Like you need to find people to seek help because sometimes it's hard and you can get lost or, and you know, you can hide and um, you've got to find those folks that are very proactive in their approach and sort of kind of, you know, ask questions around that and move in the, in the interview process. That's really important. But the biggest thing, one of the biggest lessons we've had learned here is onboarding. Onboarding is so critical because it can be very intimidating your first day sitting there and not having anybody to talk to. And so we've evolved our onboarding process, um, you know, pretty dramatically over the last couple of years to, you know, we kind of map out everybody's first 90 days now. And, you know, they need to know exactly who they're talking to, exactly what they should be focused on, exactly what the expectations are. And we can still improve there. But even from things like time management, like I think there's still opportunities for us to improve there, especially for some of the younger folks that come in and, you know, they're living with four other buddies in San Francisco or they're, you know, off on their own somewhere and, you know, wherever. And they get up in the morning, like, how do I, how do I spend my day? And so we're getting a lot more prescriptive in terms of just even time management training and what percentage of the time should, and per week should they be focusing on these types of things? What percentage of the time should we focus on these things, even Smart. like learning and development. And so the onboarding process is something that is just so critically important um, for a remote team. And there's, there's you know, still opportunities to improve, um, but I think we're doing a pretty good job now. Nice one. So you just talked about hiring profile and, and some of the things yep. that you need to assess to make sure someone's ready for that. You talked about yep. <clears throat> time management and you also talked about onboarding. Can you give an, like uh, the audience an understanding of like 
how specifically prescriptive you're getting. When you say like your first 90 days, you're mapping it out without giving, you don't need to give all kinds of detail, but just like how prescriptive sure. are you getting with the time management piece or like the first week or like, you know, is it hourly and, and, and what they should be doing each hour or, or is a, is a chronological cadence that they should be going through? Like, how does this work and how prescriptive you get? Because I would venture to say that you guys would have a best in class worldwide uh, onboarding program. So talking about this a little bit would be, I think, helpful. Sure. And, and, and yeah, I mean, it's pretty prescriptive and very detailed. And the way it works is we've got sort of a company-wide onboarding program. Um, the, uh, the first designer that I hired, um, he now developed and runs that whole program. That's all about, it's like the first day is just logistics and get everything set up from a technical standpoint. Um, you know, being remote, we actually, um, you know, we give everybody $500 um, when they start to set up their home office, right? And so we know it's not easy, right? If you need a monitor, you need a chair, whatever. We also, another small thing is we give everybody a card that has $100 per month for coffee shops. It works in any coffee shop. And so we know people are going to need to get out of the house and have some social interaction. They're going to work at Starbucks or whatever. Early days, we used to have unlimited Starbucks cards. When I started, everybody had unlimited Starbucks card. And it was awesome. But you can imagine... Starbucks sell a lot of food. Things got a little crazy early on. So we had to, we had to ratchet that down pretty quickly. And so now we've got, a, we've got limits on them. You know, enabling people with like all of those things um, out of the gate. And then after you kind of move through the company-wide onboarding, then it goes into the role specific. And there's sort of different tracks around day in the life as a salesperson, what you need to know. And then it's sort of product is really heavy for us as well up front. How do you learn the product? And then content is really good, big for us. We have so much content, best practices, all of that. And so it's like along those tracks that we really invest, like here's what you should be learning this day. Here's who you should be meeting with on this topic and like going through that. We also do a, you know, a buddy system for, for the role. And so, you know, you buddy up with somebody, they kind of check in with you at the end of every day. Um, and then you have check-ins with the, with the head of onboarding as well that does check-ins with the class to make sure everybody's on track. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty good. I mean, you basically detail out everything that you feel like somebody needs to know to be successful with their job and then determine sort of in order what they should be focused on, how deep they need to go, who the resources are that they should be uh, reaching out to for it and what the content is and just, you know, basically giving that as a, as a resource. That's awesome. It's an ultra type A exercise I mean, documenting all yeah. of that. And most of the time that gets lost as people leave the organizations mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah. That'll obviously never be lost for you. It's a, it's a, it's a retention exercise for, for content as well as headspace. And you want to have brain drain as much as well. So let's talk about yeah. um, one more thing uh, within that, which is um, communication and, and how that yeah. plays into culture. So how do you sustain yeah. a culture? And what is it that you guys do for communications uh, to proliferate that culture and, and keep it? Yeah, it's interesting because you know, I've talked in the past like, so the communication and collaboration can be addressed through technology in a lot of ways, right? In the remote environment, like everybody we use, we're on zoom, which we use, you know, Slack we live in. Um, and those are, our, you know, envision we use obviously. And so those are kind of our primary communication vehicles, obviously with, uh, with email um, and collaboration and tools. Those are really important. Um, but it's interesting. Like we've almost got to the point where Slack kind of, not breaks, but you know, at our scale, you got to figure out when something should be an email where it's a little bit maybe more trackable versus when it should go on Slack. And so we're sort of revisiting that. Um, but you really, in the remote environment, you've got to double down on the culture and, and you've just got to really over invest there. And, you know, we do, we do a lot of things. Um, the, the, one of the biggest things I would say is, you know, really in any company, I feel like instituting values is really important. And so how do you institute some core values that you want people to, to operate within. And that's how you should be hiring people based on those values, managing people based on those values, put them in their performance plans, put them in their comp plan, all of that. And so what we do is like we celebrate those values a lot. Like every meeting we have a value award winner and we celebrate the value or um, there's just little things like little things like we have a, um, there's a, there's a tool out there called bonusly, which is um, really interesting. It basically it's like a kind of micro rewards where you, we integrate into Slack with a Slack channel and everybody at the company gets 30 or $50 per month that you have to spend. And so what happens is, you know, I'll say, Hey Brandon, this is a great podcast. Boom. I'll shoot you $5 and everybody sees it. And then you could throw on there two bucks or, Hey, you crushed that prospecting meeting. Here's three bucks and you can attribute it to a value or a hashtag of value. And it, it adds up and people see it. And so because we're remote, you don't get a lot of those pats on the back or shaking hands, walking out of a meeting. So it's a really powerful and engaging way 
to just give those little quick hits of, of recognition that are again visible to everybody. And people make real money off it. Like people are buying, you know, bikes and Xboxes and stuff because the money adds up, and then you can exchange it into a marketplace for uh, for things. So like those types of things are just really important in terms of like celebrating. Um, because you have to learn to celebrate. Like I think one of the things as a fully remote company you do need to understand is like you kind of have to learn how to do everything remote. You can't say, all right, we're going to be remote, but we're going to get together every month and train in person and we'll do our celebrations. Like you got to learn how to train remote. You got to celebrate remote. You got to hire remote. Like everything, you got to build that, build that playbook. And it's not always easy. And there's still opportunities to get together and we do that. Um, but for us, we get together more we do one annual thing that we've been out in two years, uh, which is great. Everybody's so enormously positive when you haven't seen somebody in person, you know, like it's such a love fest, you know, it's great. Um, but we do, we over, we overemphasize getting in front of our customers and our community and tying those, like we kind of overinvest in sending people to community events or customer events. And so you, you, you get to meet and talk to folks on the team and um, but you do that and kind of tie it to, uh, to customer interactions as well. Wow, that's really cool, man! That example, bonusly, um, and putting yeah. that into Slack or your comm channels to to get virtual pats on the back. Plus, you got the reward, and you got the recognition, and it's peer driven. And you have to thirty to fifty bucks, and you have to spend it. I mean, that's like that's both yeah. prescriptively tactical. Thank you for that, and then also a great example of how to do um, both in person uh, companies as well as fully remote companies or somewhere in between. Like, you, anyone can do that. Any organization can, can do that. Yeah. Cool. All right, Ron, you've been, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's funny. We do have a Slack channel as a fully remote company that's all house swapping. So people go in there and literally will just say, hey, I got a place in Toronto. I'm heading out for a town for a month. Anybody want my place? And somebody else will say, yeah, I got a place in London. Who wants my flat for a week? And people trade houses or people go and, you know, we had a group of folks on my team that rented a house in South of France for like a month and like, four or five people went and worked together. And it was funny because I was, I was like, Oh, here we go. Like these guys are going to be whatever. And so I actually measured their productivity before and during their, their time in this house in South of France. And the productivity was actually higher because I think people understand that they have to earn the right for this remote benefit and people take it very seriously. And so, you know, I think we have that culture where we know, like, maybe this isn't for everybody, but for me personally, it's really rewarding to spend time with my family or travel or whatever. And like, you got to make sure that you're held accountable and you're available and you're earning the right every day to have that type of a benefit. And I think that's pretty pervasive in the, uh, in the vision culture. Man, that's great. Good examples too. All right. Hey, we're going to wrap here. I've got one more question. It's a rapid fire question. Sure. Um, and I asked this to every single guest. I explain to the audience each time that I usually ask this question on people's birthdays. Um, your birthday is in February, I believe. So I don't yeah. think it's now, uh, which yeah. is August. So I'm pretty sure it's not, uh, yeah. what is the most important learning or lesson you've acquired professionally in the last 12 months? Oh, in the last 12 months. Yeah. I put a time parameter around it. So you really have to like, you know, think about recency. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I mean, the one thing I'll tie to kind of, uh, the, this book that I've been reading that the, the power of moments by Chip and Dan Heath is all about like, how do you create sort of these interesting and compelling moments? And um, whether it's, you know, personal, they talk about some examples of the hotels and things like that. Um, but from a workplace, like especially at a startup, like you've got to create those, those legends and those, whether it's their first day of work in doing something interesting or, you know, we held, held a training in Amsterdam a couple months ago and I brought out like champagne and we all toasted and took this crazy picture. But it's like, when we all leave here, you're going to look back at those moments. And so now when I go into, you know, our off sites or whatever, and especially, you know, you go through turbulent periods, like how do you figure out how to create these like memorable things that everybody's going to look back on when their envision story is over and say, remember that? Like, and so I've sort of started to bring that into things that we're doing and think about it in the framework of how we're going to create something that is going to be a memorable, you know, significant point in their envision story. And how do we celebrate that and make it uh, make it a point uh, moving forward? Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. If you appreciated and enjoyed the episode, go ahead and make a comment on the post for the episode on LinkedIn. If you love the Neighborhood Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Until next time, go get it.